Welcome, my name is Kirsten Parsons. I am here with Ingleside, pleased to host Ann Ellett. We are excited that you're joining us today for her to share with us about women and Alzheimer's disease. I do wanna introduce you to the Ingleside community. Some of you may be familiar with us or one of our communities, but I just want to introduce you to all three of our communities and my role here at Ingleside. I do work specifically in our healthcare level. So I am in our assisted living in our memory support assisted living neighborhoods. We have three communities. Our flagship community is in Northwest DC, Ingleside at Rock Creek. We have our sister community in Occoquan, Virginia, Westminster at Lake Ridge, and our youngest community, Ingleside at King Farm in Rockville, Maryland. Each of these three communities are not-for-profit life plan communities. They do have each level of care, so independent living, assisted living, and skilled nursing. We also have memory support neighborhoods and skilled nursing rehab, short-term and long-term care. One of the things that we're able to offer as we have availability is a respite stay within our memory support programs. This is an opportunity for a loved one if they have been postponing travel or need some time and a respite situation for their loved one, um, whether that's for their own medical procedures or again for something um, like seeing grandkids after a couple of years of not being able to see them. This is something we're able to offer. It's a 30 day respite for your loved one who does have a dementia diagnosis. And this is something we have availability at. Ingleside at Rock Creek and Ingleside at King Farm right now. So if that is intriguing to you, or if you would like to tour our communities or just have general questions, you can reach out to me directly. My cell phone is here on the screen as well as my email. And we are offering great educational events just about every month. So whether it's to come see the communities or to ask what's coming up next, please do reach out and introduce yourself. I look forward to meeting you. So Anne, I pass it to you now. Thanks so much. Nice. Thank you so much. Um, well, welcome everybody. Um, this is a topic, women and Alzheimer's, that's near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, Alzheimer's has actually been referred to as a women's disease, which we know, we do know, of course, that men are affected by it also, but we're going to hear some information today about some of the research regarding Alzheimer's in women and some of the really alarming uh, statistics about women and Alzheimer's. So if you can bring up the first slide. The, um... Ian, give me one second and I'll pull up your slides. I've got mine pulled up. Sure, no problem, no problem, yeah. So I don't know if we have uh, some uh, gentlemen also registered and signed in today. Uh, certainly this is a topic that does apply to men also, but today we're gonna uh, kind of focus on some of the specific characteristics and incidents of Alzheimer's with women. I think maybe everyone on this call, except for me, is uh, living on the East Coast. I'm living on the West Coast, so it's still just midday here for me. Thank you. Um, if you can go ahead and go to the next slide, thank you. All right, so <clears throat> as I mentioned, uh, Alzheimer's has actually been referred to as a women's disease. Um, it's no secret that we are more likely to get the disease. And I'm gonna talk about some of the research and some of the ideas they have of why that might be the case um, today. But if you show on the next slide there, um, so it's, it's quite uh, distinct how Alzheimer's affects women and it's a two to one ratio. And so two thirds of the Americans with Alzheimer's disease are women. And I also just wanna clarify that Alzheimer's is just one type of dementia. Uh, it's the most common type, but there are many different causes of dementia, many different types of dementia. And in fact, people, it's possible that you can have Alzheimer's disease and have vascular dementia with it. So 
what they're finding is that uh, there can be more than one thing that's affecting um, our cognition as we get older. But with Alzheimer's disease, they do know that it affects women uh, more frequently than men. And the next slide. So here's, here's some interesting statistics. A woman in her 60s is twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's than to develop breast cancer. And we hear a lot about breast cancer, uh, but really if you're in your 60s, you have twice the risk of developing Alzheimer's as breast cancer. If you're over 60, you have a 20% chance of developing Alzheimer's and that chance will increase the older you get. There are some studies that show if you live to around 85, you have an almost 50% chance of developing Alzheimer's disease. The bad news is it, of the, it's one of the top 10 causes of death in America and it's the only disease without any effective drug or course of action. Alzheimer's is, as more and more research has, has gone into it, they're finding that it's a very complex medical condition. And perhaps it's not just one condition, perhaps it's a cluster of conditions, uh, that there might be different types of Alzheimer's, that there might be different factors that affect it. Similar to breast cancer, where they're finding that there's different types of breast cancer, there's different treatments for different types of breast cancers. And so that's what they're trying to tease out in research is um, what, what can be the most effective treatments for Alzheimer's as they go on with their research. So the next slide. So when we talk about women and Alzheimer's and we're twice as likely to get it as men, but yet there's a real lack of research, unfortunately, uh, focused on women. So of almost 1700 studies that were reviewed, there were only 22 that focused on women in dementia and women and Alzheimer's. So that's just slightly over 1%. Um, it's, it's not great. It's not great. So they uh, do recognize that they need to uh, realign some of the research to put more focus on women. Much needed. Next slide. So I'm a nurse practitioner that has specialized in dementia for well over 20 years. And when I would go into an assisted living or a nursing home, I wasn't surprised to see mostly older women living there affected by dementia because women, we live longer than men. So I thought, well, this makes sense. Uh, there's gonna be more women as you get into say late eighties, nineties. So it's gonna make sense that there's gonna be more women affected. But actually um, now they're looking at other things because the ratio shouldn't be two to one. So yeah, there something about hormones, the estrogen is, is it reacting uh, and causing uh, something related to dementia? Could it be heart health that's important or is it genetic variations? So those are the areas of research that they're starting to look at is what are the unique uh, factors in women's health and in our uh, physical and genetic makeup that might be putting us at greater risk. Next slide, Kirsten. So here's a couple important studies uh, that they're, they're working on. One at a Stanford University. And there's a gene, it's called the APOE4 gene which if you carry that gene, you're at greater risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And they found that when they compared men and women who carried this gene, again, women who had the gene were twice as likely to go on to develop Alzheimer's disease as the men who had the gene. Well, why would that be? Um, so they don't know, again, is there something about 
estrogen or something about our unique genetic makeup that's reacting with this gene and putting us at greater risk. And the other study, this is a very long standing study that's been actually going on for decades there in Massachusetts, the Framingham study, where it started out looking just at heart health. And they found that men who have heart disease are more likely to die in their middle years. Uh, so a little bit younger than women typically might pass away from heart disease. And so the men who do live in to their later years, into the 80s and 90s, perhaps their hearts are healthier, which puts them at less risk for Alzheimer's disease because uh, cardiac uh, pathology is a risk factor for developing uh, Alzheimer's disease. They're very, they're very connected, they're finding out. You know, the, the saying now is what's good for your heart is good for your brain. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that too. But uh, uh, they're finding that people who have heart disease and uh, other conditions such as diabetes um, and obesity actually have a greater incidence of Alzheimer's disease also. So again, they're looking at the differences between women and men's heart health and saying, is this a potential factor in developing um, heart disease? Thank you, the next slide. And, and we know that, that for a long time, uh, the medical community made mistakes about with women and heart disease. They didn't really understand the differences and women would go into emergency rooms um, having um, heart illnesses, even having a heart attack and it would get misdiagnosed because our symptoms are different. And so how do we know that, that isn't being, something isn't being missed with Alzheimer's disease? There's a lot they need to study yet uh, about it. Well, some good news is the Women's Alzheimer's Movement called WAM, and there's their website. It's a great website if you wanna look it up. They have a lot going on, a lot of information there. They have partnered with the Cleveland Clinic, which is a, a you know a renowned research institution, and to study Alzheimer's and women, and uh, to look more into what could be the causes of why we're so much more affected. You may be familiar with Maria Shriver. She's been an advocate for. Uh, Alzheimer's and research and fundraising for many decades she, because of incidents of Alzheimer's in her family. She's very committed to it and she's now uh, the lead person for the WAM. So she's getting a lot of publicity, some good fundraising and helping to focus those studies on uh, women and Alzheimer's disease. So they're hoping for some, some good movement on uh, some breakthroughs on research on that. It's really kind of amazing when you saw that previous slide that out of 17, almost 1700 research studies, only 22 were focused on women. Um, so more women scientists are going into this field and there's also just more focus on women and Alzheimer's disease. So good news for us, we're hoping. Okay, next slide. Thank you. Well, not only are we um, twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease, we're also twice as likely to be a caregiver for someone with Alzheimer's disease. Two thirds of families, uh, two, two thirds of family caregivers are women. Uh, so we know that, uh, which, which is, you know, not surprising looking at the history of our traditional role, but looking at how it affects women, it affects our health, it affects, of course, our professional uh, careers. Almost 20% of uh, Alzheimer's caregivers who are women had to quit work in order to uh, devote full time or the, the tasks were so complicated they needed to devote have more, more time and had to give up their work. Uh, it impairs our health. 
in greater ways than it does with male caregivers. We have higher levels of depression and impaired health, um, probably because many women caregivers, we will spend more time in those tasks, uh, take on more tasks and more complex uh, cognitive, functional, and behavioral problems. So not only are we more likely to be a caregiver, uh, we can be more affected by it. Currently, there's about slightly over 11 million unpaid uh, caregivers, family caregivers in the United States, and two thirds of them are women. So about 8 million um, women in the United States are caregivers for someone with dementia. That's a lot. That's a lot. Next slide. Thank you. Well, again, I think some good news is, and I'm always amazed when I, I hear the stories of some of the these women, they're real heroes. Um, we are a resilient uh, group. We, we really are. What, what you hear some women have gone through really throughout their lives and the challenges they've met and been successful with, we are resilient. Uh, we're good at connecting and networking. We're resourceful. Um, I think just, you know, like the WAM, the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, we, we recognize the value of working together and when, one of the things that I do in my role as a nurse practitioner is um, I do caregiver groups and I'll work with families who have a loved one affected by Alzheimer's disease. And I always talk to them about forming a team. Who's on your team? Uh, you can't do it alone. And I think women are better at this. We're better at collaborating. We're better at networking and asking for help. So I can't uh, underestimate or, or say enough about the value of support groups. Any of you on this call who have a loved one uh, that is affected with Alzheimer's or if you're affected with Alzheimer's, if you've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, there are support groups both for people who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's to tell you about resources, to give you emotional support uh, to connect you to resources. And the same thing if you're a caregiver or have a loved one with Alzheimer's disease, I really encourage you to consider joining a, a support group. A lot of these are done remotely on, by Zoom now if you don't have time to go to a meeting uh, on site, but very valuable. And I got to see the value of that again just recently with a neighbor whose uh, wife uh, was affected with Alzheimer's disease. And he said, oh, I don't need a support group. I, I can do this. And when he finally did get in a support group, it was like, oh my gosh, I've learned so much. I can talk to people who totally understand what I'm going through, what my challenges are. So again, look around. If you're not already connected, consider one. Um, ask for help if you're a caregiver. I think as women, we tend to think, oh, I, I can just do this one more day or I, I'll be able to do this. I don't need anybody. Ask for help. Uh, I call it putting your team together. Um, you've got to be able to take some breaks. We've got to know our limits because otherwise it does affect our health also. Just, I put up there the um, phone number for the national helpline with the Alzheimer's Association and they can uh, direct you to resources in your area out there if you're on the East Coast, or you can look up your local Alzheimer's Association chapter and uh, try to get connected just directly more locally. But so worth it to have those connections and people you can talk to and people who can share resources with you. Okay, well, more good news. Um, and this is a, uh, I want to try and encourage you if you haven't already seen this, it's about a 50, 60 minute film. It was uh, disseminated out by the, by PBS. It was, it was on the many of the national PBS stations. 
and it's called Alzheimer's What You Can Do. And it has the latest in research. It interviews a lot of scientists and uh, looks at the results of a lot of long-term studies about what we can do to affect our risk factors. And we know that the brain changes connected to Alzheimer's start, in many cases, we know that they start decades before we start showing symptoms. So you might be um, 85 and now showing symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, but probably by the time that woman was 40 or 50, certainly 60, they could have seen changes in her brain on an autopsy. So they know that the changes are slow, um, they occur early. And so the more we can learn about choices we have and lifestyle choices, uh, the more, the earlier we can start those, the better it's going to be in terms of getting a benefit from them. So I encourage you to, to look this film up. I'm sure it's on YouTube. Uh, or you might be able to search it through your PBS channel. But it's, it's quite powerful and it gives you hope because it empowers you by giving you information of the effect of things like staying physically active, um, having good social connections, uh, perhaps looking at your diet and uh, keeping mentally active. All of these can help have uh, benefits in terms of preventing or even slowing the progression of the disease. And that's why if you have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or you know someone who's recently diagnosed, there's still value in making these changes. It can slow the progression. So I encourage you all to, to look that up. It's, it's great information. So if we look at our lifestyle and you know, hey, I love my, uh, my French fries as much as anybody, but we do have to admit that sometimes the American diet isn't the healthiest. Uh, doesn't mean, and I'm gonna go on and talk a little bit more about diet, doesn't mean we have to become vegetarian or you have to uh, cut out all those things you love. But again, it's having balance and it's looking at, um, the benefits and the risks. So if we do develop a lifestyle, uh, a healthy lifestyle model earlier, it's gonna help potentially delay or prevent dementia, which is a great thing. It's also gonna help your heart. It's also gonna decrease your risk of developing diabetes, things like this. So um, again, the brain isn't in isolation. It's, it's what, what I said is what's good for your heart is good for your brain. And um, so well worth learning what you can. And then at least you have the information you can make the choices as you feel you're comfortable making them and fits with your lifestyle. Next uh, slide. All right, so I, I mentioned that they think that maybe Alzheimer's is not just one disease or one condition. It might be a cluster of conditions, um, like, kind of like, and that's the frustration of the researchers. They're trying to put these uh, pieces of the puzzle together. Uh, they, they think they have developed a medication that might uh, affect one part of one of the causative factors, but it doesn't seem to be enough. It's not effective because it's a very complex condition. And um, so they, right now they're saying, uh, again, if we can, the earlier we can look at lifestyle choices, um, it's gonna help decrease their risk of getting symptoms of dementia. Next slide. So there's my favorite slide. It shows you with a glass of wine. You don't have to uh, cut out. If, if you happen to like a glass of wine once in a while, you don't have to cut that out. Um, some of the studies are showing that that can be part of a healthy diet. Uh, this is another study, very important one, uh, published in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. And uh, again, it has good news. 
it looked at, this is a big sample, and so it's very significant because it looked at almost 200,000 people. And, you know, when research is done, the larger the sample, the larger the people who participate in the research trial, the more valid the results are. If they look at just one or two people and they go, oh, it looks like if they do this, it helps them, not very valid study. When you're looking at 200,000 people, uh, very significant, the results in this study. So uh, it showed that people who have a healthy lifestyle, so they, they looked at people who were 60 years or older who did not have dementia, and they looked at their lifestyle. And if they, people who had a healthy lifestyle, this is incredible. I went back and read this again to be sure I got the numbers right. They had a 300% lower risk of developing dementia than those with an unhealthy lifestyle. And I, I can tell you that because when I do my work in nursing homes or assisted living, I often see people who have had sedentary lifestyles, uh, have been, I'm not talking 10 pounds overweight, but have been quite, had a lot of extra weight on them. Uh, certainly the smoking and heavy alcohol use uh, often that is the history of people I see who are affected by dementia later in their life. Not always, not always. There's no guarantee, but certainly that's a, a common thing that I find. So something to pay attention to. This is very powerful data. Um, again, it, it gives us tools that we can choose to use if we're comfortable with them. Next, next slide. Okay, so um, I don't know if anyone here participating on the call, if any of you are like to cook or have been reading a lot about cardiac health, there was something that came out called the DASH diet, uh, D-A-S-H, and it was developed to help lower uh, blood pressure and uh, decrease cardiac disease. And they also then began to find that the people who kind of followed this diet, it looked like they had less risk of developing dementia. So then they fine tuned it a little bit and now they call it the mind diet. And again, really great results in this study. Uh, very powerful. This is from Rush University and it was uh, the study was sponsored by the NIA and they published it in 2015 and found that the MIND diet lowered Alzheimer's risk by 35% by people who followed it moderately and up to 53% for those who adhered to it rigorously. So again, it just gives you tools, but this is kind of a fun cookbook. It has um, lots of recipes in there. It has good information in there. You can leaf through them and uh, pick out a few that you like. But it, again, it gives you more background and more information on the value of a healthy, uh, healthy diet. And uh, pretty much you can have anything you want to eat. It just gives you the information to choose the quantities and how often, how often you want to uh, make these choices. So I'm, I'm interested in when we get finished here, if any of you on the call have any information about this or have tried any of these diets and what your, your reactions are. Okay, next slide. Now I'm guessing that many of you have heard about the Blue Zones. Uh, this was a book that came out um, I'm, I, I apologize, I should know this, but I'm saying at least 10 years ago. And I thought it was fascinating. Uh, I know a lot of the doctors and nurses that I worked with at the University of California out here, uh, we studied this because we went, wow, this is pretty good information. So Dan Butner, the author, he and some other researchers, they looked all around the world to find where are people living to an old age, but also living well? So they're 
they're healthy, they're still active, uh, they still have good cognition, they're still physically able to take care of themselves. And uh, what was unique about these places in the world that uh, had these types of populations? So on the next slide, he originally identified five locations around the world. I think if you go to the next slide, you can see them there. There you go. All right, so interesting. Um, the only one in the United States is out here in California. Uh, it's not on the coast. It's uh, in a place called Loma Linda, which is a town about maybe 60 miles east of the Los Angeles area. And what's unique about that town is that there's a very significant part of the population that belong to the Seventh-day Adventist church. So the beliefs and practices of that church have influenced pretty much the whole town. There's a university, Loma Linda University out there uh, that does a lot of the research and studies. But when Dan Butner studied areas all over the United States, this was the only one where people lived several years longer than the average age in the United States. And they lived well. They were healthy until very close to the very end of their life. So the Seventh-day Adventist church, this is the only, of the five, only one of the five sites in the world where they are vegetarians. So you don't have to be a vegetarian to be healthy, but this particular um, area there, Loma Linda, the majority of the population are vegetarian because of, um, they are members of the Seventh-day Adventist church. But it's not just that they're vegetarian. Uh, they believe as part of their religion uh, to take time to take care of their bodies. They uh, encourage people to allow time for regular exercise. They encourage uh, people not to smoke. Um, I don't believe they drink alcohol there either. And they very, have very close-knit families, so heavy um, social support there also. And these were the things that were consistent across all five is that close social support. Uh, they, so often when you think of older people in our country, they can become uh, socially isolated if, they're, if they still live in their own homes, they uh, may not know their neighbors or they might be too frail to get outside much or their friends have moved away or passed away and they don't have a good social network. And this was one of the things that uh, Dan Butner found across all five of the uh, blue zones is that people were socially connected throughout their whole life. So late in life, 80, 90 years old, close to 100 years old, they had friends, they were part of either a family structure or a social structure, a community uh, that was important to them. So they weren't isolated. So that was very important. The other thing like in Loma Linda that he found at all the other zones also was that people were still physically active. Um, they, they were doing their shopping every single day, not like us that back up to Costco and fill up our, our, the, our trunks uh, every week or two. Uh, they would go out every day, so they got a little walk. They were doing their own washing. Uh, they, they might have a little vegetable garden that they tended. They might have a dog that they walked. Um, so regular exercise, they did not become sedentary. Um, so I... I think we're learning more about the continued value of that. Uh, our, our saying of, you know, being a couch potato, that's not a good thing. <laughs> we don't want to be a couch potato. So social connections, good exercise, healthy diet. You didn't have to be a uh, vegetarian. The only one that is, is there in California. The other four sites, they all ate meat or fish or both, but it was not in huge quantities. Um, it was a small portion of their meal. 
So they did get animal proteins. Um, many of them did eat uh, dairy uh, cheeses and milks and things like that, but they um, they were not vegetarians. But it wasn't not a, we're not talking about a plate of ribs here or a big steak. So a small portion of their diet. Each site had something unique uh, that went with it. Uh, the site in Italy is the one where the men had the longest uh, longevity. And I remember, uh, I've only been to Italy once, but I, I do remember being in some of the small towns and in what would look like their central plaza, there would be four or five older men gathered around a table and uh, they might be drinking coffee together or they might be playing dominoes together. Um, sometimes they were smoking together, <laughs> but you could tell that these were men who had been connected for years and years and years. And these men looked quite elderly, but they had walked there and probably met frequently there in the, on the, in the table on the plaza and enjoyed each other's company. So again, the importance of social networking. Um, in Japan, as in at these other sites also, the women were very connected to a, to a group of women that they um, had known some of the time since childhood. And also the elders in all of these five sites, uh, many of them were still connected and felt purposeful with their families, they might have, uh, they might help watch their great grandchildren for part of the week or a few hours once in a while. They were still connected to their families, and um, that that seemed to have an important value also. And I, I think of that because my children, I live in California, my son's in Seattle, and my daughter's in Texas. You know, I I'm lucky, I'm healthy enough, I can travel to see them frequently. But it's not like that everyday connection um, when they when they live nearby. Okay, next slide. So I want to put a plug in for early diagnosis because as a nurse practitioner, I often hear people say, "Well, what's the point? There's no treatment. There's no cure." I'm not. I'm not going to go. I, I, I'm having trouble with my memory, or I'm not thinking very clearly, but I don't wanna get the news. I'm not gonna go in uh, for testing. What's the point? And I wanna put a plug in for early diagnosis. If you or someone you love is, you think, having some cognitive changes, there are some, there's some real value in going and getting the right diagnosis. First thing, there are other medical conditions that sometimes mimic or can cause um, changes in our cognition, our thinking, and you wanna be sure that you don't have something like that that could be treated. So it's, it's worth it to go in. Uh, also, to me, being able to be involved in decisions is, would be very empowering, very important. And the earlier you get the diagnosis, the, the more time you have to, to be thoughtful about, well, where do you wanna, um, what, what do you see the rest of your life? And where do you want to live it? Um, we talked about the benefits of uh, being socially connected and how sometimes older adults in the United States become isolated, very socially isolated, or they might be separate from their families. Uh, that's a, to me is a great argument for looking at moving into something like assisted living because you're going to have access there to, to making friends to being involved in clubs or activities that are interesting and that you can share those interests with other people. So you're not gonna be socially isolated. You're also gonna have things like probably better nutrition. Um, you know, if a person lives by themselves, they might not cook a complete or balanced, balanced diet. So you're gonna get access to, to good and, and hopefully delicious food if you move into one of these places getting the diagnosis early helps you set priorities and say what is important. Um, I've been putting off traveling across the country to see my sister. I'm gonna do it now. 
Um, so getting that decision, getting that information early, um, it gives you time to also look for resources in the area. Uh, wh where is the educational programs in your area? Where are the, um, the support groups? What, 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 uh, what can you um, join or be a part of? Uh, but it takes time to research and find all those things. So again, there's, there's benefits from that early diagnosis. And then a lot of people feel that one way they can contribute is by being part of clinical trials. So if you live near a university or a large city, there might be uh, clinical trials where people who've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's can contribute by agreeing to participate in a, in a research trial. Uh, that will help hopefully yourself, but also other people down the line. And then I like to mention, often there's a stigma attached with the diagnosis of dementia. Some people, when they get diagnosed, they, they don't want to tell anyone. Uh, I think more and more you're seeing people that we know, celebrities and other well-known people coming out and being willing to talk about it if they have such a diagnosis. But if you can be out and about, if you can be involved in your own decisions, you're gonna show people uh, that your life isn't over, you can still be engaged, you can still be involved and you can still participate. So I think there's a value in uh, showing people that you can still enjoy yourself and also be involved in important decisions in your life. Next slide. So some of the takeaways from today, um, I, I hope you all know Alzheimer's is not a natural part of aging. Um, I think 10, certainly 20 years ago, I used to hear doctors say, well, what do you expect? She's 80 years old. Or what do you expect? She's 85 years old. Um, I think people don't say that anymore. We don't expect people to have dementia as they age. Um, it's more common, but it, it's not a normal part of aging. Currently, though, it's still 100% fatal. There's no treatment or cure. So we have to push for more research. We have to educate ourselves. We have to look around us for what are the resources that we can use to make life better for people who are living with dementia. If you have Alzheimer's in your family, it doesn't mean you will get it. And if you've never had it in your family, it doesn't mean that therefore you're protected, unfortunately. Um, that's one of the things they're still studying is why do some people um, develop Alzheimer's and other people don't? But we do know that healthy habits can help us. So again, I encourage you to educate yourself on these choices as much as you can, because really Alzheimer's, it's a double whammy for women. Uh, we're more likely to get it. We're also more likely to be a caregiver for someone with it. Um, so I hope you'll take away that there is some good news now um, in terms of more research being done on Alzheimer's in women, and also that there are more tools that we can use to help prevent or slow um, Alzheimer's disease. All right, well, thank you all for listening and um, I'd love to hear some questions. All right, Ann, I don't see any in the chat yet, but um, if any of our attendees want to type something in the chat, Ann's going to remain on for a few minutes to answer any questions. I can uh, mention there's been a lot of publicity about this new Alzheimer's drug that came out this last year. Um, it's called Aduhelm is what it's being, is the... Uh, the brand name, Aduhelm, A-D-U-H-E-L-M, Aduhelm. 
And the FDA just uh, within the last six months approved it. And there was a lot of controversy about it uh, because while it seemed to be making some changes in the brain, it wasn't really demonstrating in terms of differences of the outcome. Um, but you'll hear more about it. I think it's something again that we need to educate ourselves about. Uh, it's called Aduhelm. And uh, at the present time, uh, a lot of doctors are not yet prescribing it. It is by an IV infusion every four weeks. Uh, so it's not a pill you take. And it does cost over $4,000 every time you get the infusion. So that's one of the reasons it was so controversial. Is Medicare going to pay for this? Uh, but you'll, you'll see more in the press about it. it. It looked encouraging in terms of it making some changes in the brain, uh, getting rid of some of the plaques that build up there that they think are associated with Alzheimer's. Uh, whether it's going to go on to show real benefits in terms of people regaining some of their lost cognition, I think that hasn't been shown yet. Okay. And Anne, I do think we have a, a couple questions that were received in advance. Um, so okay. I can share some of these with you. And some of them you have um, already touched on expertly in, in your slides. But one of the first ones was many studies indicate that lifestyle ch choices can positively affect our brain health. Is there one lifestyle change that is most important. And I don't know who's going to be the brave person to pit exercise against diet, but go yeah. for it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, again, the more we can educate ourselves, the more choices we'll have and the more comfortable you'll be choosing things that you think fit with your lifestyle. So um, I wouldn't pit anything, but I would say, um, hey, can we all make little adjustments? Could we I'll park a little bit further away in the parking lot and maybe walk a few extra steps? Or could we also say, um, maybe I'm not going to uh, cook everything in butter. You know, I'm going to use olive oil. I mean, so what little changes it gives you tools to make choices that it hopefully can uh, be comfortable. Because if you're not comfortable with them, if you just feel like they're being imposed on you, you're not going to keep up with them. You're going to do them for a few weeks and then they're going to go by the wayside. So it's making those little steps. And when you look back, you can say, oh yeah, actually I have made some quite a few changes, but little by little, not all at once. And you know, you were already touching on socialization being such an important part of brain health. And then also even medications um, that are new that an individual would maybe have already heard about this year in the news. Um, another question is, if I do things like crossword puzzles, will that keep my brain sharp? Yeah, that's an interesting one because um, I, don't know, I think it was about 10 years ago, there's a study that came out and said that people who did the New York Times crossword puzzle had less uh, dementia. Well, then subsequent studies showed that wasn't true. If you do crossword puzzles every day, you get better at crossword puzzles. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have dementia. But... Um, Yes, challenge your brain. Uh, Wordle is the new thing that's out, uh, but challenge your brain in every way you can. And certainly crossword puzzles are challenging. I can't do them. I've never been able to do them. So if, if you like crossword puzzles, do them, but also look for other things. Uh, they say, what is a new skill you can learn? Um, can you... You know, two of the skills that they say are the most complex and really exercise our brains. One is dancing, like learning ballroom dancing, because you have to coordinate your brain with your feet and the, uh, the music, the tempo of the music. And so they say people who, who learn a, a dance and dance on a regular basis in their older age, that's a great brain exercise. The other one is learning a new language. It's very complex. So pick what you like. Um, I think the point is to not, not stop challenging yourselves. Uh, so whatever you like to do, um, whether it's uh, brush your teeth with your left hand, if you normally use your right hand, all of those things, they say challenge our brain in new ways. So uh, it's, it's easy to say, oh, I'm tired. I don't want to do anything new. Think of something that you like and um, go to an educational lecture once in a while. Uh, 
um, do something that uh, will challenge you, those are the most important things. And I think in some ways that answers one of the other questions, which was what to do if I'm concerned about memory loss. So, and um, that would be one part, right? And then a second part would be to consistently be seeing your primary care um, at a certain age, certainly to begin those um, assessments, right? And make sure you've got one every year, a cognitive assessment, if there is really truly some concern there. Right, right. Um, you know, I used to work at the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center here at the University of California. And um, what we found is that people's sense of themselves and their changing abilities was the most indicative of a change in their cognition. People would come in and they would go, they would be very high functioning, might be working as a CEO somewhere, but they'd go, you know, something has changed. I, I'm having trouble organizing myself or I'm having trouble remembering or I, I missed a meeting. And we would give them all kinds of uh, tests and they would all come out normal. They were, they were excelling everything, they were fine. And so we would go, hmm, we began to keep track of these people and they would, but we would say, we're gonna see you again in six months. And when they came back in six months, then they had had enough changes that it began to show up on the tests, but they were sensitive to their changes even before it began to show up on the test. So if you think that you're having challenges in ways that you didn't used to, um, then just like Kirsten said, go in, talk to your primary care doctor, uh, maybe you'll get a referral to a neurologist and uh, be begin to dialogue and learn what you can about what's going on. Because I said, there's also the chance that there's something else, uh, some other physical illness going on that can be treated. So you right. wouldn't want to miss out on that. Want to rule out something different, right? We have a question in the chat. So what is the latest thinking on living arrangements during several stages of dementia? I've noticed some continuing care communities offer something to bridge between independent living or assisted living in a memory care facility. Yeah, I think those are great uh, approaches because first of all, when someone is diagnosed with dementia, it's not like they suddenly become incapacitated. They don't. Uh, many people are able to be quite independent for quite a long time. And it's gonna vary from person to person. Some people um, are still very socially appropriate and engaged. Um, other people are still very verbal and can have great conversations. Um, some people, again, if we can uh, encourage people to keep moving and keep exercising and uh, active. That, so every person who has a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or dementia is gonna be different. So you need to look at them individually and put up put together an individualized approach. And I think these bridge programs, these transition programs often are great solutions for that. Um, there's no hurry because someone has a diagnosis of dementia to say, oh, they should move into memory care. Um, many people can continue to live very be, and be very social uh, for quite a long period of time. So the, I love the bridge programs. Yeah, absolutely. I can share from a community perspective that we have residents who are in our independent living who do have a neurocognitive change diagnosis um, and they are receiving caregiver support in their home, you know, a few times a week, even maybe somebody to be a companion with them allows their spouse to um, do the grocery shopping or have a social event. And then we also have a day program. So again, once somebody is really in that more marked right. Um, stages of uh, memory loss, they're still able to do so many of their clinical things for themselves, like using the bathroom or showering, but really they just need engaging activities that are at a different pace and that are modified for their attention span. Um, and so that's our day program. And then we do have a residential program. Um, we have it at the assisted living level of care. So an individual who needs some support at this time with not so much, they um, cannot do anything for themselves, but they need the cueing and those reminders for, you know what, why don't we go use the bathroom now? Or why don't we have a sip of water? It's been a little while since we've hydrated, you know, those types of 
queuing as opposed to this total nursing care model where you're doing four. And then we do have long-term care on our community campus. So when someone is in that advanced or end stage um, to be in a setting where they're receiving a high end of nursing care, and not to say that somebody progresses through each one of those levels of care. I mean, we have individuals who age in place in independent living, bringing in additional care in that setting. Um, so I think, you know, we've seen kind of all of that, but when you're looking at a life plan community or a community that has each one of these levels of care, um, that's a really thoughtfully set out um, design for aging. We have a few more I questions. That. I know we're, we just have a couple minutes left and some of them, I think you've already answered, um, not even knowing the questions, but already kind of getting <laughs> to them. Um, one or two that are kind of related Somebody saying I'm young, um, 46, and have to write things down, set multiple reminders um, for alarms to remember even simple things. Is this a sign of early Alzheimer's? And maybe related to a question like that, um, the latest maybe diagnostic tool for Alzheimer's and also what are the early stages of Alzheimer's? Yeah, um, well, good question. And uh, when someone tells me, I, I frequently get asked this question, you know, I, I have trouble with names or I'm having trouble remembering things or I have to write stuff down. My first question back would be, is this something new for you? Is this something that's changed? Uh, for instance, both my husband and I, we are like awful at remembering names, but that's been the way we've been for a long time, nothing new. Uh, so if this person feels like, yes, I didn't used to have to remind myself, I, I could remember multiple things. Uh, now I'm having trouble, that's a change. And that would be a great time to go in and start having that discussion with your uh, healthcare provider. Uh, 46 is young, but it's not, there is a young uh, type of Alzheimer's that can affect people in their 40s and 50s. So uh, one community I worked at, the mother was 85. She did not have Alzheimer's, but her daughter who was 50 did and lived there with her in the assisted living. So um, if you feel like this has been a change, I would definitely go in. Your doctor's gonna wanna know, are you on any new medications? Or do some really good health screening and testing and then some neurocognitive testing also to try and get to what that is. But if this is the way you have always been, then I would not be concerned about it. Well, I know it's coming up on five o'clock. I wanna answer one last question. I think you, you know, mentioned this in the beginning, but in terms of Alzheimer's being the same thing as dementia, if maybe you wanna just provide a, a quick um, definition there and give some light on the differences, and then I know we'll wrap it up. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, Alzheimer's is one type of dementia. Dementia, if you think of it like the word cancer, and then there are many different types of cancer. Uh, dementia is the, the broader term. Alzheimer's is one type of dementia. It's the most common type, but there's other types uh, such as vascular dementia, which is more related often to high blood pressure, uh, changes and damages in the brain that's being done maybe from uh, cardiac and high blood pressure. Uh, there's Lewy body dementia. There's frontal temporal dementia. Um, there's dementia you can have from um, excessive alcohol use. There's dementia you can have from head trauma. So there are many, many different kinds of dementia. Uh, but And you can also have uh, on autopsy, they can find that you have Alzheimer's disease but you also had vascular dementia with it, or you had Lewy body with it. So it's possible you can have multifactorial um, condition going on also. But uh, the Alzheimer's Association, I, I think if you go on their website, they have great information about other types of dementias also, and also um, guidelines for uh, how to go in and, and get tested and uh, what kind of testing your physician will be doing. Lots and lots of resources. And so one of the questions was about um, resources, specifically financial for supporting with you know, care in, in this diagnosis. But I would second that is the Alzheimer's Association has a lot of resources um, and a lot to read through and then finding um, other, you know, whether it be financial or educational options. So, and you've been so thorough. Thank you so much for sharing with us today and um, lingering a little thank bit longer to thank answer Thank you, everybody. All right, well, I'm gonna- evening.
Yeah, I wrap this up now and I will send out a link to the recording to all of our participants. Thank you so much for joining us on behalf of Ingleside. I'm grateful that you're here. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Good night, everybody.